Tell me one time you made a mistake. The mistake I made was not killing him. Oh wow. Hi Peter, thanks Hi. you. Thank you I for tell coming. You. Um, no can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your name, age, and where do you live? My name is uh, Peter Tritton. I'm from Gloucestershire, born and bred in Stroud. Uh, well, most of the time, anyway. I'm aged 46, I think. What are you working on at the time? Well, for bread and butter and money, mm -hmm. painting and decorating. Okay. But I'm also trying, my, my aim is to start importing cacao. Mm -hmm. uh, from Ecuador in order to produce uh, chocolate products. Do you have experience in import export? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> My team actually did a background check. What, legal you? background check? <laughs> no, just an just, uh, internet background check. It's kind of modern Probably explain background it. check. It's like, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit um, about uh, this article and when you came out? <clears throat> yeah, basically I, I was captured in Ecuador uh, after being under surveillance by the British police for two years. Mm -hmm. And they finally caught me in Ecuador, exporting cocaine. So know. it was like a, someone that brought you yeah, out? Yeah, there was or... one of my partners, uh, who was Colombian, had been arrested early on in, in, a, in an operation. And the police put pressure on him and he, he became an informant. Mm -hmm. He was released and uh, basically took me and about three or four hundred other people down. Oh wow. He got a lot of people arrested worldwide. Change the topic. What's what you're most uh, passionate about? Staying alive. <laughs> Staying alive. Yeah. After spending that much time in prison. Even now. I mean, the amount of people that have died around me throughout my life is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. And not yeah, a lot of them were to do with crime, but a lot of them weren't. For example, three of my girlfriends have died, mm -hmm. um, and starting from a really young age. What success means to you now and what it meant then? And did it change a lot over time? Yeah, I, th I think I've certainly scaled things back to some extent. Uh, I mean, the, the reason I got into drug dealing was that, I mean, the whole reason, one of the main reasons was because I wanted to generate enough money to, to invest in other businesses, legit, straight businesses. Oh, that's... But yeah, that never quite happened. And I just kept becoming involved in bigger drug deals. Mm -hmm. When you were in your organization, were you like on a leadership position? Were you in the drug trafficking? Yeah, in the drug trafficking, yeah. We divided it equally between the three of us, basically, me, a Colombian, and a Chilean guy. Mm -hmm. When those two got arrested in one of our labs in Crystal Palace, mm -hmm. everything sort of fell on my shoulders. And, and I know entrepreneurs quite often find it difficult to delegate uh, mm -hmm. responsibility to other people. And I know for sure that was definitely one of my problems earlier on. That was actually my question. After that, it was like, what do you, what makes a good leader? Not to my own trumpet, but mm -hmm. when when we started the the trafficking, bringing the cocaine in from Ecuador, I insisted mm -hmm. on doing the first one myself mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be sending people to do something that I hadn't already done myself, mm -hmm. even though I just finished parole for my first sentence. So I mean, loads of red flags popped up everywhere, and I got stopped in Holland with the tent and still managed to get it through. How? Oh. Because our system was so good. The system of impregnation uh, that we used. So, But they didn't find it? It can't be found by x-ray, can be found by the scanner, can be detected by dog. Why can't it be detected by dog? Because it's, it was oh. being made into rubber. It was a piece of rubber. It yeah. wasn't cocaine wrapped in plastic. Okay. I later found out it's another reason why the police weren't stopping or they knew that if they, if they stopped the mules, they were gonna have a really difficult time proving it in court. Mm -hmm. So they never actually got a single passenger. Mm -hmm. uh, so what they would do, they would wait for us to set up a laboratory so that there was actual cocaine present, mm -hmm. and then they would raid the laboratory on the, the, the basis of information from the Colombian who had become an informant. And that's how it got basically caught. And that's why the operation went down. I mean, I, well, I mean, it was down to the Colombian coming out of prison and acting as a, a, a paid in. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know whether he was paid or not, but he was an informant for the police. Describe a difficult situation that you have been through, that you were able to, like, to see it through, and how you dealt, and how you dealt with it. It's it too <laughs> 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 
No, I'm just scared that one. If I ask as well, tell me one time you made a mistake. I think we should skip that as well. <laughs> no, no, well, the one time I made a mistake yeah. was trusting in that Colombian. Oh, The gotcha. mistake I made was not killing him. Oh, wow. Basically. Yeah. I mean, the, ba the biggest mistake was not walking away and, and stopping, really, as soon as the trouble started. Yeah. I went on the run, disappeared to France, got smuggled out of Britain by the Turkish Mafia. Mm -hmm. And then decided to do, to do one last job because we were still working mm -hmm. and flew out to Ecuador to do the one, and it literally was the one last trip. And they, the British police had been told that and they knew it was their last opportunity to arrest me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew, what, I, I knew, knew what was going on, and people were warning me as well. It's yeah. almost you, you accepted it that that was going to happen and you were fine with it, I guess. Yeah, I've always sort of had. Uh, uh, foresight and sort of premonitions. I've had dreams that have come true. You know, oh yeah, I know people are going, oh, that's a bit weird, hippy dippy shit. <laughs> but it's true. It freaks my friends out quite often. I'll say, oh, you know, someone will, I'll think of something and they will call me. Yeah, my best question was like, what are your strengths and weaknesses? So I guess strengths would be telepathy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a product that we created. How do you. Do you know the guy in the box? Is it the guy from North Korea? Yeah, it, sounds, it looks like... Uh, Kim Jong-un or Dun. If you have three words to describe him, how would you describe him? Oriental. What? Looking. Oriental looking. <laughs> Oriental looking, that's two words. Uh, happy. Mm -hmm. Hungry. Hungry, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very white teeth. If an Hollywood movie was made, who would you want to be in the actor? Playing me? Yeah. Well, Brad Pitt, obviously. Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> when I was in prison, people used to call me Brad Pitt. Not those white, but anyway. That was your uh, prison my nickname. nicknames. The other was Casper, as in the friendly ghost. Because I was so pale. <laughs> Casperines. And uh, what, what song would describe you? The would Drugs describe... Don't Work by the Verve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a nice one, yeah. And um, this is basically your, the book, right, that you wrote? El Infierno, yeah, that's uh, the book I wrote after getting out of prison that describes the, basically my time in prison in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, it's published by Avery Penguin. Mm -hmm. You can buy it on Amazon and most other good retailers. Why is it not you in the picture? Uh, they did want me to be on the cover, oh, yeah. I, I declined. It's kind of misleading if you think that this guy is pure trick. Yeah, that handsome dude there. <laughs> Do you know what? That that wasn't the original cover. That's the the publishers oh. wanted that cover. The cover that I I have my own design in mind. Oh, okay. And that was a globe with um, a white line running around the equatorial line. Oh, that's cool. And it was going to be called Ten Years on the Line because of oh, Ten Years on, on the on Line. Okay, line campaign, of course, yeah. Equatorial line because mm. I spent ten years in prison there. Pretty much better. Why did you go for now? Because the publisher said it's far too intelligent and people won't understand. <laughs> so. Pod Barsky, he said, good book, but this prison doesn't sound like it was tough. He had the What's cushy the life in there. He only has to look at the, the massacres that have just happened in the prison, in the second prison that I was in, in Guayaquil, where nearly 300 people have been killed. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends was beheaded. I was sent a photograph of me holding my friend's head. Um, so yeah, Mr. whatever your, your name was. Um, <laughs> Podolsky. Go and spend 10 years in that prison and see how you fare. <laughs> Yeah. And did you integrate well in the prison? Uh, in the prison, Akita that I first went into, there was a wing kind of mainly for foreigners. Mm -hmm. And there were guys from all over, all over the world, mainly Europe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically, I, I mean, I ended up sort of taking that wing over, mm -hmm. uh, like I do. The prison wing? Yeah. You know, the Colombians had their own little gang, the, the Ecuadorians had their own little gang. So I thought, well, we need a gang. So for, formed a gang called a Euro band because Spanish word gang is banda. Sounds like a... It's kind of a piss take. It's like a Eurovision yeah, pop band. That's yeah, that's what I ended up getting me transferred to the second, well that and trying to escape. Oh, you tried? You tried to escape? Yeah, we, me and some Colombians bought a cell. Bought? Yeah, you could buy cells there. Oh, you can buy, yeah. So bought a cell and started digging a the tunnel. They got wind of the fact that I was trying to escape, me and the Colombians. And they transferred us all around the country, split us up and sent us to different prisons. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got sent to Guayaquil, which was a really bad prison. There was a big difference between the two? Yeah, Quito was, like, like Guy said, was pretty cushy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were gangs in there, but not to the, yeah, not to the degree that uh, the prison in Guayaquil was. Mm -hmm. There were 26 wings, 8,000 prisoners, and the prison was sort of split in half between them. 
and they were at war with each other. I mean, handguns, machine guns, explosives, hand grenades. That's what the prisoners had. The guards didn't have guns. And why were they not escaping? Well, this is what I said to them. What well, I remember one day they pulled out a kilo of C4, uh, you know, yeah, plastic C4, yeah. with yeah. with the electronic desk. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I looked at them. I said, Why have we sat here? The the, the the exterior wall is there. You've got machine guns. You've got handguns. I mean, you know, I'm talking a lot of guns and ammunition. And you've got a kilo of C4. Mm -hmm. Just blow the fucking wall and let's go. Yeah. The problem was that they were making too much money inside the prison. Gotcha. You know, their lives outside of the prison were, were pretty bad. And uh, what kind of what kind of people you dislike the most? People that are not honest and treacherous and people that betray you. Particularly when they're looking in your eye and they betray you. People are lying straight to your yeah, face. Yeah. yeah. Because another thing that I was bad at when I was young was trusting people too much. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, I wanted to see the good in everyone and, and, and giving them too many chances when really I should have been more cut through it, brutal and gone, yeah, you're full of shit. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> <laughs> if you had £2,000, you know, how would you double it in 24 hours? Legally. <laughs> well, legally, it's kind of easy. <laughs> you can triple it, but... You can give me, actually, you can give me legally and illegally. Well, illegally. And I don't recommend this. No, of course, <laughs> of course. Would be to buy cocaine, <laughs> cut it and resell it. No. And as I said, I'm not suggesting that, mm. not promoting it in any which way. And I'm not saying that I do that anymore because I don't. <laughs> uh, legally, I don't know. Illegally, it, it's, it's very, very, it, there is a risk. There is a high reward, but it's actually very easy. Yeah, which is another reason I, you know, I went, you know, I stupidly opted for the quick, easy route. Mm. I mean, it wasn't particularly easy and it wasn't very quick. And do you find that with your story and stuff that opens up different career options for you or different opportunities? I've got somebody working on the screenplay for a mm -hmm. possibly for a Netflix series. Oh, wow. About my life and times and crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that certainly wouldn't have happened if I hadn't done what I'd done. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the greatest achievement that you made? Surviving 10 years in Ecuador in prison? No, I don't know. Uh, it's an achievement. Write the book, pretty chuffed about that. Are you planning to write an, another book? You know, I'm halfway through the prequel as well. Do you think, I know it's just, it's kind of made up sense, but you think that prison changed you in a lot of ways? I suppose in many ways for the good, because it's put me off crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, finally, took two sentences, but it got there. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was also just seeing the amount of damage that it did to my family and friends mm -hmm. whilst I was in there. And the amount of them that were like the diet as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so you no, know, I lost a lot of people when I was in there. Do you, do you still feel the facts of of all the time that you spent in prison? Well, I was injected with TB uh, whilst I was over there. Gotcha. And uh, that's why I've been coughing throughout the interview. Not because I've got TB now, but because it damaged my lungs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD. Mm. You're still um, dealing with them right now? Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I went for therapy and I, th I found that may just make me worse, to be honest. Oh. I'm like, you know, I'd go in there happy and come out in bits. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um, I actually found writing a book was quite uh, cathartic, as they say, and uh, it allowed me to get a lot of it out. Uh, one thing that uh, I'm going to ask you to do is actually to play a game. And I'll give it a go. No. <laughs> That's me being stubborn. <laughs> is, is it possible to get into the center? Of course, yeah, yeah it is. Cool. Oh. So I go around to the in round. No, no, it's not. <laughs> you don't have to do it in one go. You can. That's how I had it then. No, fuck. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Was that it? Yeah, round, round, round. There. Oh no. <laughs> there. <laughs> and then. Gotcha. Thanks. Check the links in the description to learn more about Pop Up. Hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Pete, you came in today for your uh, interview. Yeah. How do you think it went? Uh, 7 out of 10. <laughs> what did you think of uh, Matteo anyway? Yeah, he's a good guy. I can tell. Yeah? Yeah.
Well, good luck. I hope you got the job and uh, thank you for coming in. <laughs>